Good afternoon, folks. Thank you for joining me here at uh, B Sides. Joining, well, and thank you for my, thank you for welcoming here to B Sides. Um, my name is Rob Kiros. So I've been in the IT and security world for the last 30 years or so. Companies like Cisco, Akamai, Riverbed, um, and most recently, uh, I was at a company called Soha Systems. And we pioneered the, the SASE space, if you know about the secure access service edge, that's what Gartner calls it, but basically application security. And one of the things I realized there was we're protecting applications with a lot of the tools that we have. Um, but our goal is to protect the data. And so I want to talk a bit about what it means to be protecting data. Um, and one of the things that, if we could just take a moment, just think about the nature of data. You know, it's the thing that we value, our customers value, our businesses value, and yet, as we try to secure it and protect it, um, we have to think about just the fact that it's a bunch of ones and zeros, right? It's ephemeral. It's data singular is the same as data plural. And my data and your data and sensitive data, it's all just a bunch of ones and zeros. So in our quest to protect this data, how do we do it? You know, we think about a data lake. You know, we talk about data warehouses and data lakes. But here you just have this big pool of data. And you dip your hand into it, you look at it, and what do you got? It's indistinguishable from the rest. And yet this is what we have to protect. We have to make sure that this handful of data doesn't go to the wrong person or go to an attacker, right? So how do we do that? We have to do it in a deterministic way. We can't just guess. And this is where I believe most of the false positive problems that we're having within our uh, within our applications and the security controls that we use are coming from. Because we can't deterministically say, this is my data or yours, and who should get it. So you all know what deterministic means. If A, then B. If Bob is able to access the data, then OK, give him access to the data. The funny thing is that we only have that on one state of three states of digital data data in rest, right? And so how do we get that determinism from this data that we have stored on in our file systems, in our S3 buckets, in databases, et cetera? How do we get that and apply it on data in use and data in motion? So that's really the majority of what I want to talk about today, and also to look at different ways of doing that. So let's look at a typical microservices application. So you've got multiple services. Say you've got a front-end service that authenticates the user. You've got a back-end service that actually goes and reads that data from a storage system. So this is typically what we're doing, right, with our storage, with our, uh, with our storage controls. And you can think about you know, partitioning the network and, and things like just service-to-service -service access controls, uh, CNAPs, cloud native application protection platforms, and service meshes, they're all doing a, they're basically the same thing. The front end knows who the user is, makes requests on behalf of that user to the back end. So what do we pass in between? The service account of the front end to the back end. The back end says, okay, I'm authorized to talk to the front end, makes the request to the storage reads an object, sends the permission, or sends the data back to the front end. But didn't send the permissions that go along with the data, and the front end didn't send the user credentials up to the back end. So what do we have? We have no way to determine if that user is allowed to get access to that data. And that's a real problem. I mean, we typically, in the computer science world, we'll call this the confused deputy problem. We have intermediaries that are acting on behalf of 
the user and the data, but they don't actually know, uh, they don't actually have the, the, the set of credentials and uh, permissions to be able to actually do what they're supposed to do. So, something we should fix, right? But we don't. <laughs> we don't in the name of agility, because we've built our microservices independently. We have isolated teams working uh, without having to communicate to other teams, or we can pull these services off of GitHub and, and deploy them pretty seamlessly into our applications, and we don't actually know what data they're going to handle until it goes into production. So we could fix that, but then we're back to the monolithic world that we were in before, because then every service has to be coordinated with every other service to either pass the credentials or somehow be able to evaluate the policy and the credentials of the, the entities that are getting past the data that they, that they move. So, we use all of these firewalls and controls that we think are deterministic to protect data when in fact we're not actually doing that. We're failing because we're not protecting the data. The, and I'll talk about this in a second, the correlation between what we are protecting and the data itself is tenuous at best. So if you go to the OWASP group website, of course you'll be able to pull down their top tens and see that the top problems that we have are broken access and broken authorization of data. Bad people are getting access to data they shouldn't. So basically this is how things are working today. Our zero trust network access, we're looking at API parameters, we're looking at HTTP headers, and we're trying to figure out, oh, okay, what is this? And should I be able to give this person, this user, this entity access to an API, but that contains no information at all about what's inside that API, what, a, what that API carries. So we can apply DLP, and there's a lot of companies that are taking uh, you know, basic firewall type controls and adding DLP on top of it, which is good, but the DLP is telling us what that data looks like. It doesn't tell us if it's yours, or if it's mine, or if it's somebody else's, right? So it says it looks kind of like it's, it's money. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But we'll classify it as sensitive. But it's not an access control, right? It's not going to keep you know, an attacker from getting access to everybody's data within an application. Great for compliance and data governance, however. But if we, if we go and start asking ourselves, you know, is there any real correlation between these API parameters in our cloud applications and the data that they carry? Can anybody answer that? No. We don't have an idea. So it's basically our expectations for what the data is that we'll carry that we're putting controls on. And our expectations, well, uh, often wrong, <laughs> maybe, but statistically, right, it's basically no longer a deterministic process. It's statistical. And so our controls aren't related to data. They're not deterministic. Whoops. Um, we're not seeing a correlation between them, and so we end up with all these problems. And it's, it's interesting that you know, companies just, you know, you've heard of defense in depth, right? And we just keep layering on more controls to try to act as backstops between things that we can't detect deterministically. <clears throat> so this is an article from uh, earlier this year. Uh, so $2.6 million on average that companies are spending on 11 different API security tools. And every one of those is spewing out false positives. They're spewing out alerts. Because if you're a vendor, you want to throw out alerts, even if they're not all that relevant. Why? Because you can't just have a screen that doesn't show anything if you're a vendor. So unfortunately, we get into the situation where almost half of the, the alerts that we see are false positives. So we've got to fix this. 
So what if you could directly control access to the data in motion? I mean, just look at the bits that we have that are flowing in APIs and to be able to identify what those, those bits were, where they came from, who the owner is, what are their permissions, and then be able to make a decision solely based on the identity of those bits. Now, what could we do with that? So attackers are still going to be stealing credentials. We can't fix that. Well, attackers are still going to be stealing credentials. We can't fix that problem. But we can fix a lot of other problems, right? If an attacker is able to get access to a server, that backend server, and force it to do things on the user's behalf, well, it's going to pass data either via privilege escalation or SQL injection attack or other sorts of attacks, be able to pass data to a user that shouldn't be getting that data. So we can detect that. We can detect certain misconfigurations. We can detect broken software bugs that pass data that shouldn't. There's a plethora of things that, that we can directly control based upon this idea of being able to identify what that data is. And there's a new problem that's come up. If we think of generative AI, is anybody familiar with the term RAG, retrieval augmented generation? So this is this is something that a lot of enterprises and companies are adopting as a way to store their enterprise data in a format, in a vector database, that can be used to uh, add information to a user's question. So I could ask, you know, analyze the company's financials for the last three quarters and project what our sales are going to be for the next quarter. And it would pull that information directly out of the rack. Problem is, all of those vectors are stored as chunks. They're not objects, they're chunks. And if you think about um, the problem of connecting chunks to permissions, it's a completely different world. So I'll talk about that in a second. But let's, talk, let's look at how we can fix this, how we could identify this data that's flowing in, uh, in APIs, data in motion or data in use. Well, EDRM or Enterprise Digital Rights Management is a technology that was developed in a decade ago or so. And it's basically um, cryptography. We encrypt the objects that we put into the storage systems and then we have a central manager that determines whether it could pass out a key to a service or to, to a user to be able to decrypt that and use that data. So it's relatively straightforward, sounds good, but then if we go from a world where we're dealing with objects to the world where we're dealing with just chunks of data from objects, we get into a whole lot of other problems. Do you put the same permissions on a chunk? that you do on the object? Hmm. If you have the chunk and you want to pass it on to another service, well, in this world, you should encrypt it, right? So how do you do that? You go ask the, the central manager for the private key so you can encrypt it? Well, that is <laughs> compromising security in and of itself. So you pass the chunk up to the central manager, have it encrypted, send it back. And then you pass it along, and the next service does essentially the same thing down the chain. And who wants to take the performance hit for that? Nobody. So this, good idea, but isolated to specific use cases where we can really only, uh, we really only need to look at the, the, uh, the objects themselves. Um, so this is what I was just saying, the messy picture that we would end up with. Google came up with a different approach. And this is what I would call the, the most technically correct way to solve the problem. Um, you can go and look up this paper. The, the uh, slides will be available to you, uh, to you after the, uh, the, the event here. But basically what it is, is 
Well, let's not be stupid about not passing <laughs> credentials of the users in the APIs, and let's not be stupid about passing permissions. Let's do both. We'll send them credentials down, and we'll send the permissions up, and every place where we can evaluate whether or not these entities are authorized, the entity is authorized to access the data, we'll do it. And they use a central authorization system called Zanzibar. Um, and you can read about this one as well. But the interesting thing about this is that we've solved the problem about that encryption. We don't have to send the data anywhere. We have the same permissions and we can move them along with the data even as we chunk it or transform it, right? One little problem with this. You've got to change all of your services in order to pass the permissions. And if you're Google, that's not a problem. <laughs> if you're not Google, then it is a big problem because your services aren't, identif uh, aren't built to do that. So there's another problem, though. When it comes to dealing with chunks, and I alluded to this earlier, if you have a chunk that comes well, when you're dealing with chunks, basically, if you think about it from the perspective of data deduplication, I know you're all familiar with data dedupe. Yeah, okay. So in data dedupe, we use content-defined chunking. We find common chunks of data that come from many different places, and we'd store them once instead of storing them for every object they occur in. Or we send it across the wire just once. So I worked at Riverbed. We were a WAN optimization company doing data deduplication. We got 99% of the bytes off the wire with data dedupe. And in storage, they can get 80 to 90%. So what does that say about the number of duplicate chunks that are flowing around in enterprises? It's a huge, huge amount. So this ends up being a real problem. What if that blue chunk that came from those two different objects has permissions that conflict with each other. Which one do you pick? That's the problem with just straight passing the permissions. So in this world where we have to deal with chunks, we have to deal with this problem specifically um, and figure out a way to solve it. So what um, what I looked at for a long time, thinking about this problem as I was at Riverbed, as I went to Soha and then to Akamai, was how can we think about a reverse deduplication? How can we think about looking at the chunks and then figuring out where they came from? Because really that's the problem that you have to do. If it, or you have to solve, um, to determine, well, is this a unique chunk that came from just one object? Is it a chunk that belongs to multiple objects? Or is it noise, like the company logo that sits on every PDF in the company or the boilerplate on every contract, right? And so in order to do that, we have to, we have to be able to inspect all of these different objects that might exist to be able to figure that out. And that's a difficult problem. So instead of trying to boil the ocean and solve that completely, we can constrain the uh, we can constrain the problem to just the data that we see moving within a given time window. So if we think about it the way that an application works, let's let's think about the time around an API call. How long from the time that that API call is made? Say it's a get operation, how long after that API call would a read of an object happen? And how long after a put operation would the write happen? And if we can expand that just a bit to try to cover those operations, now we can focus ourselves just on the objects that are being read and written within that given time window. And over time, we can then build up our knowledge about the different sets of objects and chunks that exist within the environment. So we don't have to boil the ocean from the start. We can look at it on an incremental basis. We can grow this knowledge of what's going on in the environment incrementally. Um, and when we get to the point where we have enough information about where these chunks come from, when we can start distinguishing 
well, are they junk, are they unique or not, then we can throw it all in a big graph database and come up with something that looks like this. And it's basically, this is matching chunks that are in common between APIs and objects. And the chunks are the little blue dots, and the APIs are the larger kind of light blue dots, objects are the green dots over there. And then we have the users that call the APIs and the, and the services that, that move those objects. So this graph can be built basically by looking at log events and having, uh, in this case, a single plug-in to an API gateway that was able to see the traffic on the front end. But this in and of itself isn't enough to be able to give a complete picture of what's going on. We can certainly connect the, the chunks to objects. We can figure out if those chunks are in multiple objects. We can figure out just statistically, wow, we've seen this in 80% of the objects, so it's probably just noise. We, don't, we shouldn't use that. Um, but this isn't quite enough for us to be able to do the authorization on. The reason is, we don't have any rational way of connecting these events together, and that's really what we need to do. Let's well, say the, the front end user makes, or the user makes a request to the front end, well, that's gonna be an event. The front end makes the request to the back end, that's another event. And the back end makes the, the request to the storage to get the data. We have to connect all the three of those together in an environment where we have really no idea what, uh, what the connection might be. So if you think about um, open telemetry, open tracing, have you heard of these, uh, these technologies? Good. So open, open tracing is basically the idea, you put a trace ID in every API call and you copy that to any API calls that you make on behalf of the first. And so you can get a whole path of, uh, of you can get the sequence of events that happen. So what if we do that with the data? We'll just look at the data, we'll think about that as a trace ID, and we'll follow that data as it moves in these API calls and connect them together in a, in a time series. And that will give us uh, kind of the overall picture of what happened. I said kind of, uh, because we have to eliminate things like impossible paths, right? This read <laughs> of the object happened after the user got the data. Well, okay, so we can toss that one out, right? Um, we also have to be able to um, make some level of interpolation about events that we don't see, right? So we saw the read from the, from the storage, we saw the chunk go to the user, but somehow there was something that happened in between that we didn't see. So we need to give some parameters around how much, uh, how much information we don't have to be able to then uh, determine if we have a connection between those two services and ones that we don't see. Obviously you can put more sensors in and try to see everything, which would be great. You put it on, uh, you know, a plug-in into an Envoy proxy on a service mesh and you have full visibility of every event that's happening. But it isn't strictly necessary. So, I built this, by the way. Um, and doing all of this time series analysis, we can get, oh, that's difficult to see there, but we can find all of these authorization violations based upon the data that's moving in the APIs, put them together in the time series, and come up with a deterministic detection of authorization failures that's happening within the system. In this example, user Bob, gets seven chunks of data out of about 10,000 from this nuco doc slash ernoid116. And we were able to determine, based upon that object name and doing a lookup into a database, what the permissions and ownership are on that object. And then apply them to the chunks that were moving to Bob, and we found out, like, this is Amy's data going to Bob, and we can flag that. And like I was saying before, this is deterministic. Right? We can look at this strictly from 
an access control perspective and not from something like a intrusion, detec uh, intrusion detection or, or any anomalies uh, that are happening within the system. And we could do this without having to change any code because we're just inspecting payloads and APIs and looking at log events. So when it comes to false positives, I can't say there's no false positives, but I can say that within the probability of a hash collision in the given environment, we'll have no false positives. And the hash collision probability is much, 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 much less than one. So this turns out to be something that's, uh, at least in the, uh, the current prototype, very successful at being able to track and identify these sorts of failures. But there's a, there's a big side benefit to it because all of that tracing of the data that we did through the application as we saw all of the events and pieced them together allow us to build a complete picture of where did the data come from? How did it move when it was first stored? Who went and got it later on? And how did it ultimately end up at Bob? And so here, you see the initial uh, write, Amy puts to this WebDAV API into uh, the service Nuco Nextcloud. It goes into cache or memory, and then the service account writes it, put three to put object nuco docs in an S3 bucket, and writes it to, uh, in this case, number four, put four, it goes to earn oid 89. And then we can see it's retrieved by nuco disrupt following the five and six. And this guy does something to the data. The fat line means it's a lot of data, the thin line means it's a little bit. So he took a bunch of, of text that was in this PDF and it wrote it to an extracted text file over here. And it put it in a shared bucket, and this is not necessarily a real attack, but you can imagine if an attacker was to do this, um, you could exfiltrate it from the shared bucket that everybody has access to and it would never be detected. Because if you're not following the data and you're not looking at the fact that here's a subset of data that came from this larger object that belonged to, data, to Amy, you won't see this. And that's where Bob gets it from. He does a, this post apps tech session and his actually his post here isn't a get request doesn't pull down the data. He did a preview of the data. And so this service, Nextcloud, actually just reformatted the data as well, put it in a JSON structure. But it was the same text, so we could see it. But all of this isn't possible if you're looking at it from, if you're looking at data from an object perspective, right? If you're looking at it from just tracking hashes of objects moving from one place to another, you'd never see this. Even if you're looking at kind of the hashes on API payloads, as that data is transformed by APIs, in this case, like I said, putting it from you know, like just a, a string of text into a JSON structure, well, you wouldn't see it there either. So we have to think about treating chunked data differently than, uh, than we do objects. And like I was saying before, as we're heading into the, the world of generative AI, this isn't the exception anymore. This is, this is going to be the norm. At least in my opinion, what we're going to see is a significant shift in the way that we're building applications going forward, where the applications are fundamentally going to leverage generative AI at their core. For example, do you want to have somebody check a bunch of boxes in a configuration? Or do you want them to just say, hey, I've got an S3 bucket that contains data that belongs to finance. Go find it. <laughs> I'd much rather have that in my application, right? So it's things like that, I think. And also in terms of the analysis of the data that, um, that we're going to see 
uh, coming in our in our next generation of application architectures. So this is really the, a necessary way to be able to secure how that data moves. So um, that's kind of it for the talk. I would be happy to take any questions and uh, get your thoughts. Yeah. If a threat actor is to get access to that application, would they, would they then be able to just see the topology in the network and how that goes? Who has access to it? It seems like it might be a gold mine to a threat actor. Yeah, so the question is if a threat actor gets access to this application, which is trying to secure your application, then it's a gold mine of data for them. Well, if it's a gold mine of data for you as the security engineer and uh, security team, then yes, it is as well to them. So uh, it does need to have significant protections around it. In this case, it was designed to run in your own application environment with your protections around it. So no data is actually getting exfiltrated. Um, and you can go and look at the results directly within your, your environment. Apart from that and putting all of the levels of protection that you would on any software, yes, <laughs> it does have vulnerabilities that we can't, uh, we can't count for all of them. Anyone else? Yes, that's actually a great question. So if we go back to uh, this picture, right? Yes. Yeah. Why don't we just turn an AI onto this picture and let it figure out where the problems are? Well, A, you want to do that to be able to say, how does this application work from a high level? How does it move data? How is that data transformed? And what overall is going on within this application? That actually opens up a lot of opportunities for doing things like debugging the application in production across all of the services rather than having to debug service by service. Think about like black box testing where you're just kind of probing the inputs and outputs of services. The problem though from a security perspective is what's the opposite of deterministic? AI. <laughs> you know, hallucinations and um, just you, you type in the same prompt twice, you get different data, you get different results. So there's a lot of hope. Excuse me, just a There's a lot of hope in the ability of AI to improve our security, to improve the way that we can do data classification, DLP, and uh, do detection of problems within the applications. And all of that is great, but it's not deterministic. And so if what we need is a, is a way to, to do access control specifically, and if we're looking to bring down the levels of false positives that we have, those non-deterministic non approaches are going to be an issue. Sure. Any other questions? Well, we have 10 minutes, so I can show you a little bit of a demo if you'd like. Basically, this is the screen that I was showing you before. I showed you a screenshot of this. So, this is a uh, this is a canned demo that we have. It's deployed into an AWS account. It has the whoops. You're not seeing this. So, is there a way that I can show this? Oh, I need to mirror the screens. 
Say before this application is running inside of an AWS account right now, and we're just looking at the the, uh, the management portal. Um, and here is basically the the list of violations that it's finding. And I will have to admit some guilt to what I was talking about before. We're flagging a lot of violations. It may not be a big problem, um, but here. A lot of these service accounts getting, inf getting uh, data from documents is because there's no explicit permission that says that that service account should be able to read Amy's data. But we can fix that um, pretty simply if you wanted to, to click on, for example, this actually doesn't, isn't uh, fully coded at this point, but you could click on this and say add a policy exception and say, nope, that's okay, and then we keep track of that policy. Um, for these other ones, like I was saying before, it's, it's all a script that's running, a Selenium script that's running and uploading data, downloading data, and such. And when we want to do the analysis of a particular failure like we had before, um, we can just find, let's find a good one like that one. And then we can get the, the call graph of all of the events that led up to this. And in this case, we have no data because it might have shut down in the back end. Um, there's an automatic undeploy function. <laughs> so I apologize for that. But you were able to see it, uh, see it before. There's another thing that we can do, and this one, probably won't work either because it needs to pull the data. But in this case, uh, we basically use AI and the way that we were talking about a moment ago to analyze the graph and say, how did that data move and what is the likely source of the problem? And it's, in this case, you could, if you looked at it and you said, well, wait a minute, this is the service that extracted data and wrote it someplace else, that's probably the problem. So we can use AI to do that as well. And in this case, um, I don't think it's going to run. But we'll give it a shot. Um, we can have AI analyze that graph and figure out where we should put a policy to remediate the issue. So we can say, oh, well, one thing we can do is don't allow that service nuco disrupt to read that particular object. Or we could say, don't allow it to read any object that belongs to Amy. And then we could push out, damn, it worked. <laughs> we can push out a policy if we want uh, to go and fix it. In this case, we get the summary back and the explanation. And here's a new bucket policy that's based upon recognizing that, um, that the objects that we want to control access to are tagged, and the system can tag those objects as well. So that's it for the demo. Any questions on that particularly? Or is it time to go and join the party? <laughs> All right, well thank you very much for your time, and it really was a pleasure talking with you.
Thank you.